Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And um, this week, so we're doing a marine mammal highlight, but you may have noticed that we didn't let you choose. Um, That was due to a technical difficulty. I tried (laughs) to do our Instagram story and it wouldn't let me choose the two pictures. So I, it would just like, it just froze and it was like, you can't do that. And so I couldn't put the two different pictures of the dolphins to choose from. So we just had to make an executive decision to choose one. We were going to do, it was the white beak dolphin versus the Atlantic white-sided dolphin. We're doing the battle of the two <laughs> white in the name dolphins. Um, and I basically said, I want to do white beak dolphin because I don't know much about those. So, and Kat was like, yeah, that sounds cool. So, <laughs> so that's where we are. Yes. <laughs> so we decided to do the white beak dolphin. And I promise, well, I don't, I can't promise anything. So the technology does that again. I don't know what it'll do. But uh, theoretically, next time you guys will have choice in the matter um, but the white beak dolphin is what we're doing this episode and uh, it's very it's a very pretty looking dolphin as cat will be talking about um so i do suggest that you take a look if you're not watching this on youtube um to take a look at the animal but there's it's an interesting mix of not knowing a lot but then knowing a lot of some stuff so it's kind of fun yeah so we'll let cat start with uh the appearance and kind of where they're found yeah, so white beak white beaked dolphins. I feel like I'm gonna struggle to say that somehow. <laughs> it doesn't seem that hard of a word, but it really is when you're like saying it. It's when like, you say it multiple times fast. Okay, I'll try to talk slower. That might help. Um, so these guys are basically found in the cold temperate waters and subpolar waters throughout the North Atlantic Ocean. So basically, we're talking um, Eastern North America, Northern Europe, um, Scandinavia, Greenland, the UK, and also the Barents Sea. Um, the distribution within the U.S. waters is somewhat limited. They're mostly found around the kind of Massachusetts up to Newfoundland um, in Canada. And I'm sure Cindy will talk about this a little bit more when we get into diet and behavior, but they do prefer waters that are less than 650 feet deep, typically. Um, so we're talking kind of more like the kind of coastal waters for the most part. Um, distribution of the, the white beak dolphin does vary with seasons. So again, we'll get into more of that when we talk about their behavior. Um, but you know, kind of a winter summer variation happening, which again, likely has to do with sea ice levels and also forage, uh, the, where they're foraging and where they're getting food. Yeah. And what prey they're eating. Yes. Yes. Which I'm excited to hear about because I purposefully did not look into that at all. So <laughs> I can, I can learn along with everyone else. Um, <laughs> So you might be wondering with the name white beak dolphin, what they look like. So these guys are a little bit more sturdy of a dolphin species, and they are about kind of eight to 10 feet in length, typically. Um, They can weigh anywhere from up to 395 to 770 pounds. So that's a pretty big range. Yeah, -hmm. Yeah, a little chunky, a little more like beefy rugby player-esque, which kind of makes sense in those North Atlantic waters. Like that's some pretty gnarly water up there pretty stormy. Um, The males are typically larger than the females. So when we're talking about that upper range, that's more likely to be the male animals that are up into that 770 pound range. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of their coloration, their, their body is mostly gray or black on the upper sides and the back. They have light gray or white patches on their flanks. And the back actually has a, a really cool kind of almost saddle patch that it is created because most of the top of the dolphin is darker. They do have this lighter patch that creates kind of a saddle patch, almost like you would see on an orca. Um, and then they also have a lighter underbelly as well. The dorsal fin flippers and tail are typically dark. So again, you kind of have this dark cape effect with like a lighter underbelly and then kind of light gray or white patches on the sides. It almost reminded me of like the hourglass dolphins and common dolphins that have those kind of tri-coloration with that mixture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And clues in the name, but they do have, they do have short little beaks, which are really cute. And they actually have white lips. So like right on the end of the snout um, is white, but 
not all of the animals have completely white beaked white mm, beaks so some, some of them do have well so some of them have completely white beaks right and then they um it was interesting apparently a study in 2016 found that only around seven percent of the adults they found had completely white beaks so you know little white lips mm -hmm. but not everybody has the full white beak and yeah i'm not sure if it's to do with an age thing or if it's just individual variation i know that the coloration does vary significantly between individuals and age classes. So it might be a combination of both of those things, yeah. um, but, but really interesting. Yeah, like um, in Atlantic spotted dolphins, there are some <clears throat> some sexual differences, uh, not great ones, but like the ma males will oftentimes have more, uh, I forgot exactly what it is, but like um, more whitish on the rostrum, I think from different mm. like that. But like there are, indications in different stations of that of it changes as they get older um and and then also but the individual variation also because the, the like the common is i think the common dolphin that has like someone did an infographic of all the crazy variations of oh yeah animals so there's like 15 different variations they've seen so i think yeah all those mixtures that gets real muddled mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks like. yeah but it's kind of neat where it just again i didn't really realize how much variation there was and apparently there is a ton so yeah. i mean I, all the pictures i saw i was like they all have that like i mean the whole beak is white and you, it's like yeah. a, it's almost like they're wearing a mask you know right there yeah like, yeah yeah that's actually a good way to good way to describe it but not necessarily so if you happen to see these animals and they don't have a fully white beak it does not necessarily mean that they are not white beak dolphins they may that, still be yeah and i think that because they they do say that the, cause there's the atlantic white sided which is the one that we were which i'll get against. to yeah which like they can yeah be yeah <laughs> yeah so before we get into a couple things of why they're different than the um the atlantic white sided dolphin um let's talk about the name so obviously the common name white beak dolphin we kind of just covered why they were called that right <laughs> so they they have these white lips a lot of the animals in theory have white beaks or at least some of them do um but their latin name is kind of interesting as well and feeds into the same thing. So their Latin name is Ligonarhynchus albirostris. And the genus name comes from the two words Ligonos, which means bottle, and rhynchus meaning beak, so bottle beak. And the That's like all the lags are, are I know. Thing. Isn't that fun? I thought that I also thought it was interesting because they have a much shorter beak than a lot of the other Ligonarhynchus dolphins. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, most of the other actually quite, you know, much longer. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, but and with that just as no you may heard me say lags that's what a lot of people will shorten the lagarynchus to lags to say oh we're talking about lags that's yeah so that's referring to that genus yeah exactly um and then the species name albarostris means white beak yeah. so again clues in the name <laughs> um so like cindy said these guys can be misidentified quite easily as the Atlantic white-sided dolphin, which was the other species that we were putting these guys up against, which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being that, A, the coloration is similar, not the same, and they are not the same species, but it is similar, and their ranges overlap considerably. So these guys are both found in the North Atlantic. So it can be challenging, especially if you happen to see them when you're at sea, or if you're just in passing, you might not be able to identify which is which. However, if you happen to live in that part of the world or visit, let me tell you a couple ways that you can ID the white beak dolphins versus the white sided dolphins. So the white beak dolphin is typically larger than the white sided dolphin. Um, again, like I said, there are those kind of like more chunky, hefty, solid looking animals. The white sided dolphin is a little bit more petite. And the white sided dolphin also has um, what they call yellow streaks. So almost more like a common dolphin where they do actually have like a, almost like a yellow uh, stripe on the side mm -hmm. um, that the white beak dolphin does not have. So if you see any kind of like yellowish coloring on there, it's not going to be a white beak dolphin. Um, the white beak dolphins are also found more typically in more northerly waters than most other dolphins. So if you're, if you're up pretty far north, and you're seeing anything that looks vaguely like these guys, you're probably seeing a white beak dolphin. Um, and if you happen to find one dead on the beach, the white beak dolphin has less teeth than the white sided dolphin. So the white beak dolphin, I believe, has about 20 to 28 teeth. Um, and the white sided dolphin, I think, has somewhere up closer to like 30 or 40. So huh. if you happen to find a dead one, then you want to count the teeth. 
there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's like when we do dolphins versus porpoises like well if you ever saw the inside of their mouths <laughs> don't shape teeth versus straight shape teeth like no most people aren't gonna see that but that's okay <laughs> right so i mean to sum up i know we kind of bounced around a lot in this section more than we normally do but basically these guys are found in north atlantic waters pretty far north um they're robust they have a nice cute little short beak they are up eight to ten feet and they have that kind of like cindy said that sort of tricoloration so dark on top little bit of a saddle patch, light on the sides, um, and then that distinctive white lips or white beak, and then like a little kind of white ring around the eye as well. So they, like Cindy said, almost as like they're wearing a mask or have little eye patches. They're really, really very pretty. Mm -hmm. And that's what these guys look like and where they live. And do we want to do uh, more, more than their name? Oh, yeah. So then we also have three, which will lead nicely into the diet and behavior. So their other, again, their common name is the white beak dolphin. Um, the other common names that they have in English, because there were a ton of other common names in different languages, which I am not going to attempt to say and offend anybody on here. Um, but they had uh, Springer dolphins, jumper dolphins, or squid hounds, I love which <laughs> let me hear about why, because I'm so excited. I will tell you. And that one is specifically, the squid hounds is, uh, I saw was specifically from Canadians. Um, that oh, had, okay. Yeah. The other ones were more generalized, but. Um, yeah, Dang, so those okay. do go into the quite what quite well the diet and behavior of what they do. So, um, with their behavior, uh, you would imagine with the names Springer and Jumper, <laughs> they do like to jump around, jump around, jump around. Right. Um, <laughs> old school. If you know, you know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um. So they um. Uh, are very commonly will like you know breach um, they jump a lot uh, they just tend to like they'll surf the bow and the stern of vessels so they are fairly social in that respect um, and so they got those um, those fun names um, other behaviors so they're <clears throat> kind of like normal dolphin groups groups of five to thirty so usually less than ten so that's a fairly common small dolphinid social structure uh, or group structure um, but it's not unusual to see up to fifteen hundred. So they can get into those very, what? yeah, very large, almost like 15. the white side is where they're just, you know, a thousand of them. That That's, is so cool. Yeah. It's more uncommon, but it's not unusual. Right. So it's that thing in the, in the middle. Um, and that's, I think, somewhat typical of oceanic species as well, that you will see them in these mm. larger groups just for food or for predator protection, et cetera. And Kat will talk about predators later. Um, so the groups can be organized by age and sex. I couldn't really find out much more. I do have some uh, new research on social structure, which is exciting, mm. um, but there wasn't too much detail on what that means, but um, there can be some kind of um, differentiation there. They are very uh, social uh, in with other species as well. So sometimes they're seen with fin whales, humpback whales, and say whales. And wow. yeah, they um, seem to be attracted to them. Uh, and the uh, going theory is that uh, maybe they're there to catch the fish that the whales miss. So if they're all going after similar fish species, you know, when those guys gulp, there's going to be some that flies off the side and they can grab an easy meal. Interesting. I hmm. wonder also if they've ever seen them bow ride or wake ride on, on those whale species because we know Ooh. other dolphins do that, right? Yeah, that'd be neat. Yeah. Um, and then they also, while feeding, may associate in mixed groups with bottomless dolphins, short-beaked common dolphins, uh, Rizzo's dolphins, and Atlantic white-sided dolphins, of course. They're all kind mm -hmm. of the same thing. Um, there has been some photo ID done on these guys, and I'm going to save that more for the new research, because that's more relatively new. But um, in terms of how far they go in, their be in, you know, in that behavior, um, they, uh, m m most of the studies I'm going to talk about later are all in Iceland seems to be the place that they're doing the most research um and they found that much of their time was spent traveling and one was that was tagged covered five thousand kilometers in 201 days wow so they do have some movement and we'll talk about that in the new research as well they don't they're not like just hanging out in one spot the same which is interesting hmm. yeah um <clears throat> Uh, they have, uh, as Kat mentioned before, they do have some seasonal movements. So it looks like they move north in the summer and then south in the winter to stay in their preferred water temperature. 
which is an important determinant on their habitat use. So, <laughs> and we will talk about that when it comes to threats. Yes, excellent, excellent. And I do have another thing in, in research that links to climate change uh, mm. that because of that. So water temperature is important for them. Um, and then the rest of the behavior I've got, um, they, they do a lot of vocalization. So they have whistles, squeaks, buzzes, clicks, and um, those burst pulses, which we've talked about in other podcasts, which are those communicative clicks that are like click whistles. And we have a hard time understanding what the heck they are. <laughs> um, but they do seem to produce many different sounds uh, and um, uh, to communicate with one another. For feeding, so now we're going to go back to that squid hound. Now, this name is funny because, yes, they do eat squid, but mostly not. <laughs> so <laughs> they they eat mainly schooling fish like haddock, hake, cod, herring, whiting. They will also eat crustaceans, shrimp, and crab, and, of course, cephalopods, squid, and octopi. Some were even found to have seaweed in their stomachs. Now, whether they ate that on purpose or not is i don't know yeah. okay so here's a question because i couldn't find anywhere that they explained like where that name came from would it be more because because you said that was more around the canadian waters that they were called that is that because there was a squid fishery and they were just seen when the fishermen were out fishing for squid so that i don't know they only said that the squid hounds came from some canadians but i will okay say in the new research of their the variation in diet and how varied it is in different locations. Okay. Okay. The primary thing they eat is very different in different locations. And so oh. that's probably why maybe they just eat more squid and octopi up in in Canada. In Canada. Yeah. Or that's interesting. Location, you know, it could be very right. um, location dependent. Yeah. Um, in one study they found 25 different species in stomach contents. So wow. they're super picky either. Um, and again, that dominant prey does vary by location, and I'll dive more into that later. Um, how I get it? See what I did there? <laughs> uh, I actually didn't at all. <laughs> <laughs> pass you. I'm like I'm um, like immune to marine mammal puns. <laughs> right, <laughs> I've done so much. Um, so they do they do have cooperative feeding, so they will work together to catch fish at the surface. So they the group will herd and encircle schooling fish and trap mm. them at the surface. But they also will feed along the ocean bottom. Which I'm glad you brought up the depth because I actually couldn't really find anything on on their dive, um, mm -hmm. the, the deepest. Or well, I found one thing on the on the deepest dive, but like where they're located in habitat. Um, but their short dive times indicate that they probably don't like super deep waters. So the one there's only been one that has been tagged with a biologger. So this is take it with a grain of salt because this is one individual. But they did fairly shallow dives to a mean depth of 24 meters, and the deepest was 45 meters. So that's only like 130 or 40 feet, something like that, mm -hmm. or 120. Um, and the max dive was 78 seconds. So that's only like a, not even a minute and a half. Like a, um, yeah. But usually shorter mean of 28 seconds. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they are mainly, I think, at least if this guy is representative, um, mainly surface uh, feeders and don't need to dive very deep and that's why they're in that more shallow water um, and i'm I sure guess which could all go ahead oh no i was just gonna say i guess that also kind of to some degree explains why they're so active at the surface because if they're not expending a ton of energy in these long deep dives like they have energy to kill i mean right. you know relatively speaking yeah. um you could afford to be more playful and more kind of boisterous at the surface than if you were doing like thousands of feet dives right. when you get to every surface, 20 minutes <laughs> right you're like okay right. so yeah interesting very interesting yeah so that's um that's pretty much what i have for for diet and behavior um they eat a lot of different things but um varies by location and fairly shallow they like the surface they like to hang out in the light in the, in the upper, upper upper section of the water fair enough um, oh uh, so then um with reproduction almost forgot um i love this one said we have unknown lifespan and I'm like, okay. And then I found others that said basically they can live more than 30 years. So we still okay. really don't know for sure, but more than 30. So they're, they're probably on par with most dolphins that are 30, you know, 40, 50 years. Um, males grow faster than females and males are larger. Mm -hmm. Again, which you mentioned. Um, they don't know a whole lot about their reproduction, but except that mating and birth will likely occur in summer months which again makes sense especially they're in colder waters you're going to have babies when it's the warmest so mid-april to late august um and this is due to the testes size that they 
they've documented. A lot of the work that they've done has been on stranded animals. Um, but mm -hmm. the testing size being twice the size of baseline ones. So during that time frame. Wow. So there's basically like, well, if they're that big at that point, that's probably when they're having babies. Or when that would make babies. sense. <laughs> so <laughs> things you learn. Um, and then strandings of newborns and young tend to increase in June and June through September. So that's probably the time they're giving birth. Um, yeah. Gestation is 11 months. So that would make sense. They're mating and giving birth in those summer months. Mm -hmm. um, the interbirth interval is unknown. They do not know how often they have babies. Um, and females reach sexual maturity between six to 10 and males are later at eight to 12, which is also fairly common in dolphins. Um, but <clears throat> going back to that considerable variation in, in individuals, there is considerable variation in age and size at sexual maturity for both sexes. For example, one immature male was 16 years old. Whoa. <laughs> so wow that's crazy no, what happened no. to that guy i don't know and maybe he's like the weirdest wow. outlier ever and that just happened to be the, or maybe he was never going to get mature because the you know something physiological right happened. right true um but huh. yeah there's some, some a why it, it's not as, as set as it is another species which is interesting yeah these guys have a lot of variability yeah which i think makes it also that much harder to do things you're like this is how they do it well except when they don't which is right <laughs> yeah yeah a lot harder to like classify mm -hmm. what we know about them interesting exactly. hmm. so that's what i have for the fascinating facts of dying behavior um we will take a quick break and get back with the threats and then some new research so we'll take just a moment and we'll be right back All right, we are back. So, Kat, tell us about the bad stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not like it's not as bad as some of the other species we've had to had to talk about. So, this is, you know, we're 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 okay on this one. <laughs> so, first of all, let's talk about their status worldwide. So, they are listed as an IUCN species of least concern, basically because we don't know a lot about them and because we think as far as what we do know, their populations are fairly steady. So, um, I could not find a global population estimate, I think, again, because these guys are, there's a pretty huge range and it's hard to do surveys up in those waters because, again, it can get pretty stormy and the seas are not conducive to doing lots and lots of research up there. Yeah. But um, I do have a couple kind of regional estimates um, based on aerial surveys and and boat surveys. So. The Western North Atlantic stock, which would be kind of the U.S. and Canada um, stock, this is from a 2016 aerial survey, was estimated to be around about 500,000. So like a pretty solid population in and around the Western North Atlantic stock, as far as we know. Um, around Greenland from 2015 surveys, it was estimated to be around 4,900 animals. So, you know, close to that 5,000 mark. Um, Iceland, again, this is from a 2016 aerial survey, was around about 60,000 animals or individuals. Um, and then in and around the North Sea region, this is, uh, it was going to be about 187 and a half thousand. So that's from a survey that was done between 2014 and 2018. Okay. So like pretty robust numbers. Um, again, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in the threats, but they're not, you know, they're not like hunted a ton. They are still hunted actively, but they're not, there's no commercial fishery for these guys. Um, so as far as we know, the populations are, are doing okay, um, which is great. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Finally, we get one that's like, we think they're doing okay, guys. Um, so let's talk about what is threatening these guys. So as I say, one of the big ones is hunting. Um, like I said, there's no commercial fishery for white beak dolphins, but um, basically what we're talking about here is small subsistence scale hunting. Um, and that occurs mostly in Greenland, Norway, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and some parts of Canada still. So there was a little bit more information given on the Greenland hunt. Um, and so I'll just talk about that for a few minutes. So there, the hunting is allowed, allowed year round. Um, but basically what that means is that it's kind of opportunistic takes. So there's no quotas or catch limits. Um, the numbers are reported and monitored annually with the number of catches that are made. Um, Canada also allows opportunistic takes again, mostly from Newfoundland and Labrador area. 
But from what we what is reported, it seems to be relatively few animals every year. It's like, you know, like 10 to 20 ish every year, if that. Right. Um, so quite a lot of variability. Um, again, because these guys have never been subjected to a, a massive commercial hunt, I think that's why the, the population seems to be fairly stable still. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as we know, the subsistence hunt, subsistence hunting is not a hugely damaging thing to their population. But of course, it is something we need to keep an eye on if the population does start to suffer. That's something we need to be a lot more careful of. Moving into another human interaction, which is bycatch. So this one actually is a little bit more concerning because we don't really have a great handle on the number of animals that are bycaught every year. So as you might expect, being in the North Atlantic, these guys are very susceptible to gill net bycatch and bycatch in trawling nets um, from commercial fisheries. In one study they had um, in Iceland that they had scars and wounds that were suspected to come from fishery interactions on 15 out of 90 photo ID dolphins. So, you know, a solid like 10-ish percent of the animals, 10 to 15 percent, um, had visible scars of interactions with fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, of course, as we've talked about in other podcasts, bycatch is not just uh, something that can injure you. Um, you can also, you know, the animals can be drowned by being caught in nets. Um, and interestingly enough, apparently bycatch resulting in drowning was reported as being fairly common mm -hmm. in Newfoundland and Labrador. And it is thought to be largely underreported since because basically if they drown in the nets, they're not causing damage to the net. So it's easy to just dispose of them and not have to report it versus like, why is there a big hole in your net? What happened right, here? Well, we had to cut them out, yeah. Right. So that is a little concerning given how heavily those waters in the North Atlantic are fished. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as we continue to experience climate change, which we'll move to next, um, and other fish species move north um, and those fisheries potentially increase in size, you know, these guys are susceptible, especially if they're moving in large numbers um, to bycatch. And again, the fact that it's reported is fairly common, but like not reported a lot, that's worrying. Yeah. Um, especially because we don't really have a handle on their global population numbers. So while we think they're doing okay, we don't really know what the numbers are. So okay. something to be mindful of. Um, as we've alluded to several times now, climate change is worrying for the white beak dolphin. And that is because, as Cindy said, they are heavily dependent on water temperature. So they show a strong preference for those cooler waters. Um, and actually, there has been recent research around the UK that suggests that the white beak dolphins are shifting northward. Um, and their populations in and around the west coast of Scotland are actually declining as they move north. So was that the the... Oh, I can't, I never can pronounce the name correctly. I, Isol, Isol, Isol Dyke, Isol Dyke study. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not oh, sure. Okay. Because I, I have yeah. one that was, it's the North Sea. There's a higher density of animals in the Southern countries in earlier years, but a slightly increased densities in the Northwestern area more recently. And that might be the first indication of a change in habitat and population distribution from South to North. And the potential explanation is the observed shift is climate change. And effect mm -hmm. on prey distribution. So that is similar. yeah. So this might be pulling from that possibly. Yeah. I mean, this was specifically referencing the, that they were declining in the west coast of Scotland because you have increasing sea, sea temps there. Right. So yeah. it might it might be related to that yeah, study. They're yeah. Pushing, they're pushing from the farther north because everything's getting warmer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's not just about prey distribution. That's also increasing the likelihood of parasites and pathogens being able to survive and increase in the population. Um, and I guess lampreys, which are a parasitic species, have been observed on white beak dolphins in Iceland for the first time in, in the last sort of like 10 years or so. So it is something that they're actually seeing evidence of these animals that typically are not found in colder waters yeah. starting to show up and actually directly impacting and literally latching onto the species. And with those species so, that having grown up around them, that it's it, or evolved around them, it's, it's going to be an issue. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So climate change is definitely mm -hmm. going to be impacting these guys more, which I actually thought quite interesting because I didn't realize they had such a strong relationship with sea, sea temperature. Yeah. You know, we tend to think of climate change mostly interacting with polar species. Okay. Um, but again, these guys live in, in the northerly waters. They live in cold water. So 
um, kind of a good reminder for all of us that it does impact those species who don't directly necessarily live in the Arctic. Mm -hmm as well. And then finally, predation. So again, because these are pretty beefy dolphins, um, mm -hmm. really the only predators naturally that they have are orcas, some of the larger shark species, like, like Greenland shark, for example. Um, very rarely they have seen polar bears attacking these guys um, in and around the Canadian waters, but that's apparently pretty rare, which well, makes sense. I mean, like these that's gonna be hard for a polar bear. To oh my gosh. I mean, it's gotta be like trapped in ice or something. I mean, right. Like, I was gonna say, yeah, like where you would actually see this happening. I'm not quite sure because yeah. you'd have like an eight to 10 foot dolphin battling with a polar bear in the open water it would be interesting. That would be like seeing like the sperm whale and the giant squid, like just like, oh my gosh, polar bear, like to going at it. That'd be <laughs> ah, yeah. So yeah, mostly we're talking like orcas, um, you know, killer whales up and around the, the North Atlantic waters are really the main predator. And then, as I say, a couple larger uh, shark species might be um, in there as well. But it does help when you're a little bit chunky and move in large groups. You're less less inclined to be eaten on <laughs> yep. by other and species. We just saw a picture of uh, in here in the Salish Sea of an orca <laughs> tossing a harbor porpoise into the air. And so remember, harbor porpoises are 150 pounds, like five foot. So, but I mean, it just chunked it in the air, like 15, 20 feet in the air. It was flying. Yep. So, yep. you know, it's just a, it, it was a good reminder of the, of the abilities of orcas. I mean, it's amazing. And so it's so it always that same thing of like, I would hate to, I always feel bad for the prey and especially harbor porpoises because that's our study animals. But at the same time, like, oh my God, what uh, the amazing things that orcas can do in their predation. So and yep. possibly, you know, eating these large giant dolphins. They're not giant dolphins, but larger <laughs> dolphins. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. So yeah, let's so, hear about the new research. Yeah. It's nice not to have like too much sadness in that. I know. I know. <laughs> like, thanks, guys. This is like a pretty positive, right. positive vibe with these ones. Just keep the climate change down. Um, <laughs> so I already talked about that. The Isodike, uh, if I'm, hopefully I'm saying that name correctly. I apologize if I'm not. Um, uh, there's a 2018 study. And so that, they were looking at strandings. So they were looking at the frequency of the strandings of when that happened and seeing that change to the northern regions, which is probably due to, due to climate change and warmer waters. Um, along the lines on um, disease, I, this one's not it's too new. It's like 2014, so it's like 10 years. But um, I found it interesting because it's on dolphin morbidity virus. So they were looking mm. at is dolphin morbidity virus vir virulent in these animals like will it is it bad for them basically because for most like a lot of large strandings and mass strandings happen due to morbidity virus in a lot of different dolphin species um and so they had two dolphins in rehab that had it but the cause of death was not attributed to the dmv infection so not due to the morbidity virus infection it was something other things um, and then the the virus was not detected in two contemporary contemporaneously stranded white big dolphins so on the same ones uh in the same same time frame in the same with those guys that had it and the stranding rate did not increase in the region and so the results suggest that dmv is not highly virulent for white big dolphins so it's not as mm. credible or dangerous as i guess virulent is more about danger not about um, spreading but um, apparently they can like handle it and not die hmm interesting which hmm. may be good if they have good immune systems whether you're talking about climate change and parasites and diseases maybe they're right. more more adept to dealing with the changes that might occur from climate yeah i mean it does make me wonder though like if you do have something like that even if it's more background and it's not going to kill you what does that do to your overall immune health in general right. and, it, and it may not be they doesn't kill it but then it lowers it so much that other things kill it. so yes right so yeah it's not necessarily passive but um Right, not necessarily, you know, bad enough to cause death in these animals. Right, I guess so. so step one is great; it doesn't kill you. Fantastic. <laughs> you right, but it. does it does it lower your immune system enough that other things could could be? Mm, probably. Who knows? And that probably is an individual variation as well, depending yeah. on a lot of different factors. Yeah. Um. So the the next couple um are from 2015. <clears throat> this is, and a lot of these are uh, actually the the next. Uh, or four <laughs> are all by Bertulli. Uh, so they are doing a lot of research on these guys. Um, but I was really interested because they were doing a lot of photo ID and social structure. So that mm. of course, always gets my attention. Um, 
So they had photo ID marks in Iceland. So they were looking at the ability to use these markings for photo ID for these animals. And so they found that white beak dolphins had notch and fin patches and fine scrapes as the most prevalent marks. And a black mark and fine scrape were the most abundant. So they were hmm. on the dorsal fin, basically, these things. Um, and there were 13 mark types that had um, what they called null lo loss rate, which were the notch, distinct notch, and amputation. So um, probably good to use for, <laughs> for things. Uh, you don't lose the, the individuals. Um, and the findings confirm that fin and injury marks are among the most accurate features to use from capture mark, mark capture mark recapture studies, um, as noted for other species. So basically, use the dorsal fin and any injuries that happen along with that. Mm -hmm. um, fin patches for white big dolphins, uh, in particular, due to the low loss rate. So those patches of, I think, pig somewhat pigmentation um, are good for photo ID. Hmm. Yeah, that was very cool. And that's what they do oh. with common dolphins down in New Zealand. Right. They have the, the coloration and the patches on the dorsal fin are, are unique and good for, for doing that. Mm -hmm. So I always like seeing photo ID being used on animals that you don't really think about doing photo ID on. So um, then the, that, in that same year, there was another study um, that uh, looked at uh, site fidelity in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And um, they were uh, conducted from April to October most likely because that's when the seas are the least bad up there <laughs> in our sea. <laughs> yep. Um, and these were during whale watching operations in uh, Faxafloy and Skjalfandi. Sorry if I butchered those names, uh, but those are the two bays uh, on the southwest and northeast coast of Iceland. Uh, and so they did minimum abundance, annual site fidelity, and movement between bays. <clears throat> And they found uh, 154 individuals in Faxafoy and 52 individuals in the other bay. Um, and the annual reciting rate was about 21% in Faxafoy and um, well, only one individual was recited in Skel Skelfondi Bay. So much more site fidelity in one versus the other. Which hmm, is interesting. Um, and they found a total of five dolphins or about 2.3% that were matched between the two bays. So there is some movement between the two. Um, and the period between recitings ranged from 272 to 821 days, um, hmm. with a mean of 28.16 days. So there's, a, okay. you know, a, a fair amount of time that they're going between these two places. And I don't know exactly how far they are in, you know, geographically. Right. Each other. But we did see that other one in 200 days went 5,000 kilometers. So... Yeah, they cool. Um, so they said the low site fidelity rates observed likely signify a much larger home range than the present study area they were looking at um, into either either other coastal or offshore zones, or alternatively may be explained by a large natural population size and or the opportunistic nature of the sampling, right? So there was whale watching, so it wasn't a dedicated service. Um, but it goes to what we were talking about before, the distribution does seem to be a much larger range. They don't have like small home ranges where they stick to one place. They're mm -hmm. moving, moving around while still having some fidelity to certain areas possibly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Um, oh, and so this one actually goes on the coloration you were talking about before. Um, this is again in Iceland by Bertulli. Uh, from 2002 to 2014, they again using whale watching trips as a platform of opportunity. They captured photographs. They found on 823 images, they found 571 individuals showing one or more color components. And they were adult, so they looked at, uh, they found adults, juveniles, calves, and neonates. A total of 26 color components were observed and described. Seven terms previously applied to white big dolphins, 12 previously applied to other dolphin species, and seven newly defined terms of these coloration mm. patterns. And so what the results showed that each age class could be positively identified by differences in specific color components. Ooh. So, uh. yeah. So, therefore, the color patterns may be useful in estimating maturity in these dolphins, just like we do with spotted dolphins, right? They're born yeah. with a tone and then they gain spots. So, these coloration patterns are very, age, seem to be very age specific, at least in some cool. other aspects. Isn't that neat? Wow. That's really yeah. neat. I don't think there's, I, I really only think about Atlantic spotted dolphins in terms of like being able to age very fairly easily by just looking at their pictures of them yeah i think any other species you're pretty much just talking like aging between like a calf and an adult right 
Like, yeah. so within the first year, the coloration changes, but after that, it's just kind of, okay, well, then you're just the, the same color as everyone else. Yeah. Like the juvenile, there is no juvenile section for most of the species that we think about. Um, even we were just talking with our colleagues. Yeah. Like, interesting. And it looks like, yeah, there's definitely a young calf and then an adult, but then there's a like short time where they just turn into mini adults and there's, there's, you can't tell the difference really between that juvenile. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I thought that was very cool. interesting going on those color pattern variations. <laughs> yeah. Um, then the next one was by Bertulli, and this one really got me because it's all about social structure, and that's my jam. So <clears throat> the um, they have basically fission fusion dynamics. So this was the first long term assessment of this for, for white beaked dolphins. They used so the sock frog, um, which is super awesome, and again those two bays that I talked about before, um, and the whale watching. So it's an eleven year data set. Um, they had 487 dolphins that were suggested to be an open population, as was already kind of shown before. Um, 35 adults were used in the study for that were cited on greater than five different days. So to look at social structure, you need to have a minimum citing record to be able to accurately define um, what's going on. So <clears throat> the mean residency time within um, the two study areas was 95 days. And the model that they used that described the movements was migration full interchange. So I think there's, a, there's quite a bit of movement um, in and out of those two sites. The social differentiation was high, which means that there are um, you know, diverse non-random social relationships. They're, they do prefer, have preferred and avoided companions. <clears throat> and um, the temporal associations best fit the casual acquaintances model, <laughs> um, which basically means that there are some there's some just like, hey, we hang out for a little bit, whatever, but there's also long-term uh, relationships. So in analyzing that data, they saw that the a lot of the associations were short-term, but there were a few, you know, some long-term across years relationships. Um, so short-term, but with desirably long-term associations fitting into hmm. a society with that, that vision fusion, what we see with other dolphins, right? There are lots of short-term relationships, but there are some of those anchoring long-term relationships that, that these animals have. So really cool being applied to an oceanic species that we know less about and can be in such large groups uh, at times. Um, very interesting to, to understand more about that. Yeah. Um, the last two that I have are now not virtually. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're done with all, all their work, which was a fantastic. Um, and these are just real quick. Oh, these ones. So, okay. So the reason why these are here is because these are interactions with harbor porpoises. And I could Ooh. not put this in because yeah ah. so the first one is in 2011 <clears throat> and this was uh two cases of physical interaction between white beak dolphins and juvenile harbor porpoises uh -oh. and so basically they had these uh individuals that they um found that had stranded um and uh, but had survived the injuries that they had from the animals um so they they have the basically like rake marks that were consistent with white beak white beak dolphins and not any of the other species that are around them. Ooh. Yeah. So they had um, scrapes along their, like the pec, pec fins and dorsal fin, things like that. And I said, given that the animals in the study survived and given the numerous rake marks on the one animal that was in Belgium in particular, the most plausible explanation for the interaction is object oriented, playful or investigative behavior by white beak dolph common dolphins. Um, but for harbor porpoises, the interaction would have nonetheless been traumatic. Which I think is well, yeah, because when you're the object being played with, that's a little traumatic. <laughs> right? Like, I'm not a ball, people. Like, I'm not a fish. Like, stop messing with me. Oh, um, gosh. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like my art. We have, we have a new puppy, and my puppy plays with my three and a half year old, almost four year old, but she doesn't really love it. And they're almost the same size. Like, so <laughs> the object oriented play there, my daughter is not excited about that. Um, <laughs> understandably. So, same thing for the harbor porpoises. Um, but the fact that the harbor porpoises survived and that their wounds are healed indicates that they were weaned at the time of the interaction or that their mother would still have been in the vicinity. So they, it's, at least they're not, not like the bottomless dolphins that just boot them and kill them. Um, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So I guess if you're going to have to be played with by one of those two species, I'd pick the white. Just yeah. And for those of you who are not familiar with what we're talking about, um, the bottlenose dolphins are actually at this point fairly well known to um, aggressively, quote unquote, play with harbor porpoises to the point that they will kill them, like ramming them. And again, kind of similar to orcas, like booping them out, you know, like yeah. ramming them out of the water. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. Yeah. 
and they're still not sure exactly why they do that, but um, there's there's many um, thoughts on on what that is, but it's still being researched. Um, and so the last one uh, was uh, is in 2022, so very recent, Samara mm -hmm. et al. Um, and this is the trophic ecology. Uh, so looking at are these overlapping harbor porpoises and white big dolphins overlapping in foraging and things like that. Um, and so they looked at the two and they had non-overlapping isotopic niches. So basically they're looking at the nitrogen content in their prey uh, and seeing if they are eating at the same level in the ecosystem. Um, harbor porpoises had a smaller niche width than white beak common dolphins, had a broader diet. Again, they had like 25 different species in one, one study. Um, and uh, they had uh, contributions of other fish species. Um, uh, the, the, for the white beak dolphins, it, they had um, gat gatoids, um, that's a, a general grouping of fishes, and other fish species. Harbor porpoises fed most exclusively on capelin. Um, and that suggests that there's niche segregation uh, and um, basically maintained by targeting different prey, right? They basically just don't overlap in what they eat, which is a great way to live together. <laughs> so, yeah, because these guys do, again, like similar to white-sided dolphins, these guys do overlap considerably in their range, harbor porpoise and white beak dolphins. So yeah. very cool. And both species also showed no long-term changes in trophic ecology, despite hmm. recent, recent ecosystem changes in the region and what we just talked about with climate change. Um, so possibly a result of adapting to spatial changes in prey distribution or shifts to other prey at similar trophic levels. So they're adapting to whatever changes are occurring. And so we're not seeing changes in their diet, which is... That's encouraging. Which is encouraging. Yeah. Like they're able to deal with whatever, however they're dealing, whether they're moving north, like we talked about, um, or there's just shifting to a different prey species or something, they're able to handle what's, what's, what's changing. So kind of a nice one to end on like yeah we can good job guys fun, right <laughs> like, well. so with that that is all about the white beak common dolphin uh, white beak i keep wanting to put common in there and i don't know i was gonna say i'm like what's the what's the common part white -beaked common dolphin. it's a white no, beak. it's a white beaked dolphin the yes. common dolphin is something else and i think we've already yes. talked about that so go listen to that podcast <laughs> yes, exactly refresh I, apparently i need to refresh on that um <laughs> so the white beak common dolphin super awesome little species um, so with that, um, I want to remind you to go check out our new, our new website. Kat did an amazing job on our fantastic new website. She did all the design and implementing it over. And I was just there to support her. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yes, good job. Much needed, much needed at certain times when you try to transition from biology to web design. It's interesting. <laughs> Uh, but she did a great job, so go check it out. It's uh, newly revamped and super awesome and hopefully uh, even better, uh, easier to find things and all the things that you want to um, check out. So do check that out. Uh, we do have the merch store there. Again, we have some cool new um, merchandise and different types of things like hoodies and hats that you can get. Uh, and uh, also you can subscribe to the podcast, and that is also a great way to support us in the um, getting the podcast to you. Um, so we are, again, a small nonprofit, so every little bit goes back to helping with our research and education initiatives. Um, so next week we will be, or next week, next episode will be a journal or topic of interest. So if you have any ideas of what we should talk about, please drop them in the, I think you can comment on Spotify, uh, but you can also find us on our socials, on Instagram and Facebook. Drop us a line, let us know what you want to talk about, and we'd be happy to discuss. So with that... We will leave you hanging on what we're going to talk about next time. And we'll see you then. Bye. <laughs> Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M dot org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>